In my case, I did three dissertations while I was at university. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to be filming a video that you guys requested. So some of you were talking about the transition from school to university and then university to work. So I thought it would be really interesting to do a two-part series on what it's like to change between these different stages of life. Um, so I compiled a list about my experience of moving between the two. This is the first video in that series, so I'll focus mainly on the transition from school to university. And I've kind of broken it up into categories to try and explain it better and compare um, between the two how things have changed. So the first category is time. When you were in school, you would have had a timetable. Your lessons would have been a set length of time. Your teachers would have managed that time in the lesson and you might have had like free periods where you, you know, did your homework and managed your own time, but mostly your day was structured. When you get to university, you do have a lot more free time. Now, I am speaking on behalf of arts and humanities subjects. It might be different for other subjects, but I might only have one or two classes a day. Some days I wouldn't have classes at all and it would be up to me to manage my own time. So I think that's a huge difference when you move from school to university because you're not used to having all of that spare time to manage. You're used to having it planned for you. On top of that, you've got to be more self-managed. You've got to be more independent. You know, some people might like to plan out what they're going to do by the hour. Some people might just like to say, these are the top three tasks I need to get done in this day. It's up to you what works best for you and you work that out over time. You also work longer hours. So the school day typically runs from 8.30, 9am to about 3.34 I think for most schools. At university the whole day is your school day essentially. Because you do with the hours what you want to do with them, it's up to you to decide when you start and finish. Personally, I liked having my evenings free, so I'd choose to start at 8.30 in the morning and then finish at about 8.30 at night, which is such a long day. Don't be frightened. I know it's different to school, but you do have a lot more work, which we'll get onto in a second. So I would structure my days that way. I had friends who would much rather sleep in till, you know, lunchtime and work till one o'clock in the morning, for example. I could never work like that. That just wasn't how I worked. But if that's how you work, that's fine. And that's something you can discover when you get to university. So sort of on the back of that, uh, tip two is about workload. Obviously, the reason you have longer days is because you have a greater workload. Whereas at school, there's a set amount of content to get through. I found in my experience of university, the curriculum or syllabus was a lot more open. There wasn't really a set syllabus. We had a wider structure of content that we had to get through. But within that wider structure, we could choose what we wanted to do. If I wanted to read two critical essays, I could. If I wanted to read 10 critical essays, I could. It was up to me how I managed my workload. And if I thought reading 10 essays would make for a better essay, then great, I'll go away and do that. But if I got everything I needed to get out of those two essays, then I would just stick with two. It's up to you. Obviously, the more you read, the more knowledgeable you become. But ultimately, that is up to you. Your, your supervisors or professors will give you reading lists that you have to get through. And some of those texts will be compulsory. Others are optional and personally I like to do the optional reading because I felt it definitely helped and made me more prepared for exams and there's a reason that your professor's giving you this material, they want to help you, it's there if you have the free time to read it, but if you don't, that is fine, that's why they mark out which texts are compulsory. And in terms of content, you go into a greater breadth and depth. So at school, you might do an in-depth study of a certain time period, whereas at university, you might be expected to know lots of different events that happened across lots of different times. In my case, we studied English literature from the 1300s to present day, and then I could sort of choose the text within that, but I needed to have that breadth of knowledge of the whole timeline of English literature, and I'd also need to go in great depth about the texts I was researching, so that's maybe a little bit different to school. And at university, once you've learned this breadth and depth, then you can specialise. So for a lot of people, they tend to specialise in their third or fourth year, so they go on to higher education, you know, masters and PhDs, and you pick a specific niche that you know you're really good at or you're really interested in. So for example, you'll have heard of a dissertation, 
this is very different to the essays you write in school, the exams you sit in school. And for a dissertation, you pick a very, very specific topic and you do a lot of research into it and you might write maybe 10,000 words or 15,000 words about this topic. In my case, I did three dissertations while I was at university, one in my second year and two in my final year, but that was very Cambridge specific. But this is an opportunity you wouldn't have at school to say, this is something I'm really interested in, now I want to specialise in that, and put a piece of research out about that. And that's really cool. Now, speaking of workload, I'd like to talk about how your work and your content is delivered and how you learn. So number three is classes. Now, classes are very different to what they were at school. In school, you might have had a relatively large class for GCSEs. There might have been about 30 of you in a classroom. A-levels, it might have been about half of that. Some classes, I mean, I took A-level German and I think there were only about five of us in that class. So some classes will have been a lot smaller. When you get to university, you're not taught as you would be in a classroom where the teacher stands at the front, delivers the content, you raise your hand, you answer questions, you interact, the teacher sets you off on exercises and so on. Instead, you have lectures, which I'm sure you've all probably heard of. In a lecture hall, your lecturer will stand at the front of the room, they might have a projector or a whiteboard, or they might just speak to you, and you will be sat in the audience part of the auditorium, and you will just sit quietly and take notes. That's how a lecture goes. There might be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, or once the lecture's finished, you can go down and speak to the lecturer. But as it goes, you don't really interact with that lecturer. But for the most part, they supply you with the initial bit of information you need to know, and then you go away and research outside of that. So a lecture might not deliver absolutely all of the content you need to know, especially in my case doing English. It would just be an idea. So it wasn't even compulsory content. I would never have to know a novel that was talked about in a lecture or a poet that was talked about in a lecture. It was just to spark my ideas and my creativity. On top of lectures, you also have seminars. So a seminar is more small interactive group teaching. Maybe that's slightly closer to what you'd have at school. You might be given an assignment beforehand. You might need to bring material to the seminar. You might need to do a presentation that you then deliver in front of your peers. But the idea is it's small group teaching. I think at other universities, seminars might be about 10 to 20 students. In my experience at Cambridge, I had seminars that sometimes only had about three people. Usually you might go through a text together or a piece of work you've been working on and you'll hear everybody else's ideas, you'll engage in a discussion. So this is definitely more interactive than a lecture. And because you get the content in advance, it means you can take all the time you need to go over it and to do your independent research. Now, Oxford and Cambridge are a little bit unique and that they offer one further type of teaching. So in Cambridge, we call these supervisions. Now supervisions can be one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with a supervisor or a professor. And the idea is you will write a weekly essay in the case of a humanities student, and you'll hand that essay in before the supervision. Your supervisor will then mark that work and you'll spend the supervision discussing your essay either one-on-one -on -one or with your partner about what they've written in their essay as well and share your ideas. And it's a really good opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one tuition, one-on-one -on -one feedback about how you personally can improve and develop. So this is why Oxford and Cambridge stand out a little bit because you do have that personalised teaching that you might not get anywhere else. This is another point that's slightly different to school as well, not just the teaching, but the way you write essays and hand in work. At school, you get homework every day from every lesson, right? You hand it in uh, maybe during the lesson and you'll get it back the next lesson. Here, I would get my question for the essay at the start of the week. I would then go away, make my own reading lists or ask for a reading list from my supervisor if I needed a hand. I'd then go away, do as much research as possible, make an essay plan, write it and then hand it in. And that's all done on my own. And I would do that once or twice a week. So you might be used to just writing one essay a term, but in university, it, you write a lot of essays if you're doing an essay subject, and that's just something you have to get used to doing. That sort of builds on the workload point of before. Of you just have so much more to do. In a week, I might have two essays to write and a couple of articles to read and a seminar to prepare for, and you've got to keep all of these things in mind at once. And one thing that's really different to school, if you didn't hand in your homework, you would probably get into trouble, right? Your teacher would say, that's not good enough, here is a punishment, or, you know, you need to do this work, hand it in to me next week, I'll extend your deadline. At university, if you don't hand in your work, your professors won't chase you. 
it's up to you to get it done. Because at the end of the day, if you don't get the work done when you should, that's on you. And it's only you that you're affecting. So, you know, make sure that you manage that independence well. Another way that university is slightly different to school is that in school, you sort of have a hierarchy, right? Your teachers are teaching you, they're above you, they have more knowledge than you. And whilst that's the same at university, in my experience, I found that my professors treated me as an equal, even though they would have had so many more years experience on me, so much more knowledge than me, they never wanted to discourage me or make me think that I was any less knowledgeable than them. They would value my opinions just as much. They would encourage me to argue with critics. They would encourage me to argue with them in supervisions. I think for them it was really important to create a comfortable learning environment where people weren't afraid to say silly things or make mistakes and where supervisors could say, wow, that's a really good idea. I've never thought about it like that before. And that's something that's quite different to school where you're just being taught content directly. I think there's more space for original thought in university and and debate as well. Now onto the fun side of things. Number four is the social life or the people. So at school you might have clubs, you know, you might have tennis club or netball club. University's no different. You will have clubs, but we call these societies. Um, during my time at university, I tried out a couple of different societies. You don't have to stick around if you don't enjoy them, but definitely in your first week of university, try as much as you can to work out what you do enjoy. And then that society will usually meet once a week. Examples include sports societies, music societies, cultural societies. There is a society for everything. And if there isn't one, you can create one. There are some really strange societies out there. I'm pretty sure in my college, somebody started a cheese and wine society and you can get a budget for that. So really, if you can justify it and you can get a professor to endorse your suggestion, then you're up and running. <laughs> Societies aren't the only way of having fun. So that kind of brings me to point five. You will be living with your friends or people who are going to be your friends. For, them, for most people, they will move away from home to be at their university. Some people do choose to stay at home and that's fine. It's, you know, if you want to save money or you live close enough to your university, that's fine. But a lot of people will be moving away and you'll be living with new people for the first time that aren't your family. And that's really exciting. Like you'll all be learning together in the same space. And this is so different to school. Like you would just see your friends through the day. Whereas at university, you can spend your evenings with these people. You can cook together. You can learn these life skills together. Um, clubbing is a really big part of university as well. Like th there is a greater nightlife, not in the sense of going out and drinking but uh, a life outside of university hours and this kind of links to my point six about greater independence it's not just work that you're more independent with but your own life you know you're in charge of that now and you do have to take on the responsibility of cooking and cleaning and you know learning how to wash your clothes properly and learning how to manage your own time and follow your timetable and things like that so I hope you found this video useful. If you've just moved to university or you're about to start university, let me know some of your thoughts in the comments below. Has your experience of moving from school to university been very similar to what I've said or do you have anything more to add? Maybe you can all help each other in the comments below and reassure each other it's not as big a leap as people make out like it is. Yes, it's more work and yes, it's more hours, but it's also more fun and more independence. So don't worry if you're about to start university. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.